Theodore Roosevelt. This guy is absolutely, without a doubt, one of the more interesting presidents we've ever had. Really, really a unique individual for a lot of reasons. A lot of reasons. And we're going to talk about some of those reasons and some of those people and his life and his times and what he went through and how he even changed our world to a great degree. Um, we don't start, our story doesn't start with us. Our story, start, our story starts with our parents. It starts with our grandparents. It starts with where we came from. This is his parents. And his, his father was also named Theodore, and his father, all his, all his life, uh, his father went by T and, instead of Theodore. That's what he was called, even as an adult. And he was just known as T. Okay. Um, his father, this man's father, came along and started in the 1840s investing in glass of all things. And what was interesting about that, he became so rich that his generation, the Theodore we know about's generation, and the next generation, none of them would have ever had to work <coughs> at all if they didn't want to, at all. There was that much money. Uh, we're talking money that's hard to even, on a level, hard to even fathom. Come on in. We have several choices of seats right up front. Well, thank you. Okay. And you'll be happy to know I've even showered today. So, yeah. <laughs> anyway. But, so this guy ends up, he goes and gets a college education, becomes a lawyer, hates it. Ends up getting involved in society in New York City because all of his life he's lived in New York City. He helped bring the city zoo into existence in New York City. He did all kinds of very interesting things and, and did, he helped bring about the financing for the Brooklyn Bridge. This guy had huge impact and the son Theodore that we know about always said about his father, this father that, that this man was the finest man I've ever known. And when you start reading about this guy, you begin to see, yeah, that's a real possibility. He really was darn impressive. He died at the age of 46. And boy, I don't know that there's an, an ideal age to die. I don't, okay? But 46 seems kind of young. It's been a while since we've been 46, right? But 46 seems kind of young. He died at the age of 46 of a uh, gastrointestinal tumor. Very quickly, he went downhill in less than three days from seemingly healthy to deceased in three days. It shocked the family. Absolutely just took them apart. When he was a teenager, he was sent to Atlanta, Georgia on a business matter for his father. And while there, he met a young lady. Now, her name was Martha, amazingly, Martha Stewart, and uh, imagine that. <laughs> but she was always known as Mitty. What's interesting about her story is that she came from the South. She had brothers that fought on the South side. When the Civil War came along, he could have joined the North, but not wanting to fight possibly fight against his wife's family, he purchased, and you could do this, and if you had money, many people did, you could purchase someone to come and take your place militarily. And he did that. And he was always ashamed of that because he always looked upon that as, on one hand, as not being man enough to be involved in a war, and on the other hand, he genuinely did not want to fight against his wife's family because he knew them and he respected them. And so he stayed out of the Civil War. And I've always thought that was kind of interesting, but what did he do in the Civil War? He realized that many families, as the, as the Civil War is going on, many families, because the men are off fighting, 
Many families are at home literally starving. And so he went to the federal government and said, we have to make a change. And he made a, an agreement with the federal government, and he went out into meeting with troops everywhere and got them to sign the paperwork so that part of their pay would be sent home to the wife and to the support of the family. What an obviously good idea. And it, it just tremendously changed how we were taking care of our military and their families. Because it's one thing to be involved in the military, it's another thing to not let the families go without. That, that's crazy. And so he helped make a change. Very good man. He met her. It was one of those things where uh, apparently love does work at first sight because from the rest of his life, he was convinced that she was the only woman on the planet. And they, it was a love match. It really, really was. And they communicated back and forth, and he came back down and saw her a couple of times, and she came up and met his family, and on and on and on. And they all went back down and married, and then they moved to New York. When they moved to New York, one of the interesting stories about her, you know who she was inter interviewed by? Margaret Mitchell. Does that name reg register? Margaret Mitchell wrote Gone with the Wind. It's always been assumed that Mitty Roosevelt was Scarlett O'Hara. And it was based on Mitty Roosevelt. Is that really true? It would really be hard to prove that because Margaret Mitchell has been dead for quite a while. But People who know claim that she was the basis of Scarlett O'Hara. And isn't that an interesting thing? I'm sorry? <laughs> well, she always thought he was, Red Butler. OK? All right. Let's find out about the, this family. They had four kids. Um, this is Theodore, the Theodore we know about, is a very little boy. One of the problems he had growing up is he contracted asthma really badly. And he often talked about the fact that his father would get up in the middle of the night when he would break out into cold sweats and because he's coughing and, and he can't sleep. His father would get up, pick him up, and walk the halls of their home for hours until he settled down. The father. That has always just impressed the daylights out of me. And uh, none of the kids were sent to schools. Uh, the, the education was brought in. They were privately tutored in, in home. This is one of the more interesting and unusual pictures of ever. When President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April of 1960, 1865, I'm sorry, Afterwards, after the funeral, America wanted to say goodbye. And most people couldn't come to Washington, D.C. So it was arranged that the Lincoln train would literally leave Washington, D.C., and it started going all over America. And it took 20 days to get from Washington, D.C. to Springfield, Illinois. Normally, it would take about four. It took 20 because people wanted to say goodbye. This is the picture. They brought the train to New York City. And what is going on here is the casket is being literally put on view. And people line the streets to say goodbye to Abraham Lincoln. Why did I include this picture? Because of this, people. Right up here. Right there. There are two little boys. One of those boys is a six-year-old boy named Theodore Roosevelt. And the just younger little boy is his younger brother, Elliot. Elliot's story comes into play next month when I come back, because next month I'm going to be talking about Eleanor Roosevelt, as in daughter of Elliot. And Eleanor is Theodore Roosevelt's niece. And so you're going to hear a lot more of that story then. But 
Those are the two Roosevelt boys watching the entourage of the Lincoln casket go by. Now, as he continued to grow, he, he struggled with asthma virtually all of his growing up years. And it was not an easy, easy thing. But this also gave him a lot of time for development of the mind, for education. And he turned into a voracious reader. How voracious? Ladies and gentlemen, he got into the habit of reading a book every day before breakfast. And he did it even in the White House. Every day. Kind of makes you wonder what we do with our time, doesn't it? And if you read the reading list of the things that this man read, it would blow your mind. Really. His, his, his depth and breadth of knowledge was just absolutely unreal. And most of it was gained at home. He also turned himself into a um, bird watcher. And he would go out and, and he turned himself into someone who could shoot birds. But then he was a taxidermist. And he kept his own refrigerator in his own bedroom because he kept in the refrigerator birds that were dead, and that he took care of them and created, and, and, and he put them on display. He was a taxidermist, among many other things. Very unusual <laughs> interest level. Really, really is. This is the brownstone there in New York City that he grew up in. And uh, it's about, there, there's four stories tall. And it's, it's hugely roomy in every direction. And, and this is a picture of him as a teenager. He was still struggling physically. And so his dad sat him down one day and he said, look, OK, you've got a choice here. You can change your situation if you will. And he said, what do you mean? And so dad invested in a personal, what we, today we would call a personal trainer and cleared out two of the bedrooms on the fourth floor and turned them into a private gym. And he literally started working out and willed himself into getting past asthma. Quite an interesting, interesting individual. Really <laughs> unbelievable. And then he took the t entrance test at Harvard. He had never been inside of any schools, but he took the entrance test to Harvard and passed it with flying colors and became a student at Harvard and eventually graduated from Harvard University. And while at Harvard, he was on the boxing team. He was on the classical dancing team. Now try and put those two things together. Do you normally think about those two concepts into one person? He, was, he created a debate club on campus. I, I don't know when this man slept. I really don't. Because when you read about his life just in college, you're going, this is unbelievable. And in the middle of his junior year in college, his father passed, very unexpectedly passed away. And it just absolutely about undid him. After he graduated from college, what he did is that he ended up, and I'll tell you about her in a minute, he ended up getting married, but he, first job, he decided he wanted to be in the one thing that his dad had never been a success at, and that is politics. And so he ran and got elected as a New York State legislative member. And so he lives in New York City, and he, he takes the train right up the Hudson River, up to Albany, back and forth and becomes, by his own words, becomes a little pompous at it and thinks that he pretty well is about the only person that really understands things. And all of a sudden, his father died. And it really undid his world. 
he really was shattered at the concept of what he had lost. Now, this is the fair young lady that he fell in love with. Her name is Alice Hathaway Lee. And he just went mad head over heels in love with this lady. What is interesting is that after dating for about two or three months, he asked her to marry him, and she said, no, not interested, thank you. I've got more to do with my life yet. Thank you. That was not quite the answer that he was hoping to hear. And so what did he do? Well, he wooed her by overwhelming her family. He would find out about where her family gatherings were, and he would show up. And he became, he started contacting her brothers and taking them out and, and visiting her parents and literally engulfing this family. And six months later, he asked her again, and this time she said yes. She did. And by this time also, because <laughs> they went on their honeymoon into several places in Europe, by this time in his life, he'd been to Europe three times, because his, his family took a year-long vacation in Europe when he was 12 years old. Year long. I don't know how in the world you'd afford that. I, I don't. But uh, anyway, he had traveled extensively. He really had. And they, he absolutely adored her. And they had one little girl named Alice. And you might even remember of her. Her name was Alice Roosevelt Longsworth. And she lived clear until 1980. And she lived in the Washington, D.C. area. And she was really quite an interesting, interesting gal. And I'll come back later on and talk a little bit more about her. But you need to know something about this one. He lives in the family brown stone. He lives with his wife and his mother because his father is deceased. There's tons of room in this living quarters, okay? It, it, they have whole floors all to themselves kind of thing. That it's a completely in, independent living. And his wife gave birth on February the 12th, 1883, to their little, little girl named Alice. And nobody was paying a lot of attention because everybody was focusing on her delivery and all of that. And mom was physically not doing well. What is really sad is on Valentine's Day, 1883, his wife passed away from Bright's disease two days after giving birth. Bright's disease is kidney failure. On the same day, mom died of typhoid fever. And, and it hadn't even been analyzed. And nobody, what in the world? And, but mom wasn't feeling well, so they wanted to keep mom away from Alice and, and for obvious reasons. And so by the time they got, realized mom is in serious danger, and they brought in doctors, and it was too late. It was too late. This is Theodore Roosevelt's entry in his journal on that day. The light has gone out of my life. I don't even know what I would do. I, I have no idea how I would mentally even handle anything like that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, especially since you're living all together. And a week later, they held a joint funeral, and both women were buried in the family plot. And he now has a eight or nine day old little baby. And both his wife and his mother are deceased. What in the world would you even do? And I, I don't know. I, I just flat don't know. That would be incredibly difficult. 
But I can tell you one thing, I wouldn't have ever thought to do what he did. And this is what he did. Because this is a picture of Alice. He left his little girl, Alice, with his sister, Bammy. Bammy is a, a, two, a year and a half older than, than Theodore. Theodore and Bammy are not just brother and sister. They're, they're like best friends and had been all of their lives. And he went to her and said, I've got to do something else. Can you please take care of my little girl? Bammy was single, and Bammy did. Bammy moved into the family home, and he, Theodore, left. Left. He moved to North Dakota. He had been, <laughs> he had been in, Nor in New York City virtually his whole life. He had um, grown up as a city, city boy, essentially. He was very proficient with horses, loved horses, and a very good horseman. So that was part of it. He wanted something completely different. He resigned from being a member of the New York legislature, and he took off and took his checkbook with him and went to North Dakota and bought land and turned himself into a rancher. He did. I don't know that I would have thought of that <laughs> in that scenario, but he did. And but before he left, he went down to, um, and I just blanked on the name of the store, and the, the clothing store in New York City. He went down and had himself design a suit of clothes appropriate to be a cowboy. Well, um, the R word dude comes to mind, okay? But in doing this, he got out there and he was convinced that he was the height of fashion as a cowboy. And all the cowboys out there just about fell off their horses laughing at him. And yet, the more they were around him, they found he was never a slacker as far as work is concerned. If, if it took clear until 9.30 at night working, he was right there. He was part of it. He, was, he, he rode horses as well as anybody. And that was, that was, they respected that. And then one night, some of the cowboys decided that they were going to go into town and just go to the bar. And so he volunteered to go with them. And he did. And they're sitting around at the table, and they're drinking and just talking, and nothing really is going on. And he gets up and walks over to the bar and orders another drink for himself. And some buddy comes walking over to him and starts giving him a bad time because he wore glasses. And Theodore stood there and took it for about a couple minutes. And then the guy very foolishly took a swing at Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt blocked the swing and came back and at one punch knocked him clear out into the bar onto a table, crashing one of the tables, and completely just annihilated this guy, knocked him out in one punch. And all of his guys went, oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> and the respect level just took off <laughs> right there <laughs> because they... That they, they were kind of starting to respect him anyway, but when they saw that he really could and would take care of himself, and did take care of himself, didn't turn to anybody and say, here, come, come bail me out of this. No, no, no. He took care of it himself. That was impressive. And there was another thing that he did. It was kind of quite impressive. He went out. They, they were out punching cattle, and two guys came along and stole some of the cattle, and it made him so mad. He went into the town and said, the sheriff, you've got to go find these guys. The sheriff says, I don't even know where they are. I don't even have the time. I'm not even going to be bothered. If you want to go find them, bring them back to me. I'll do something about it. That challenged him. And so he took one of the guys with him, and he found those guys, tied them up on horses, and brought them all the way back to the sheriff and said, here, here. And they were arrested, and they were prosecuted. <laughs> he was an interesting guy. He really was. And that was just the early part of his life. Now, 
This is his about to become in-laws. And their name is Caraway. Her name is Edith Caraway. He and she had known each other. Their families had known each other since the kids were, you know, and they'd always been friends. And now all of a sudden he realizes that now in his life, she's really, she was really more than just a friend. And he contacted her, and they started corresponding, and they ended up getting married. And it was a great marriage. It really was. There was another five children with this marriage. What do you do to make a living? He ended up being the police commissioner in New York City. And that's kind of interesting. Did he have any background in police work? Nah. Nah. However, he loved his city. He loved New York. And he hated the idea that not everybody respected the law, including the police department. And so once he became the police commissioner, he would go out at night. And he would walk the alleys at night trying to find policemen who were not doing their job and wake them up and say, get off your butt. You've got a job to do. And all of a sudden, it completely transformed the police department. It really did. It made people stop and become very much aware that this is not just a token thing. This is real. You have the responsibility of, of affecting law. And you need to set a good example. And he earned the respect of the city police force. And then Washington, D.C. called and wanted him to come to Washington, D.C. and become the assistant secretary of the Navy. This is in the late 1890s. And so he did. He did. And this is the Naval War College in Annapolis, Maryland. And he threw himself into learning about that. And as a result of this, he wrote one of 20 books during his lifetime. And one of the books is on the naval battles of the War of 1812. He knew nothing about the Navy. And he started studying. And I'm sure that he would today say, where in the heck was Google when I needed it? But uh, he started studying. And he became a literally an aficionado about naval terms and boats and weaponry on boats and on and on and on. And he probably would have continued doing that for quite a while until February the 15th, 1898. And one of our warships was in, the USS Maine, was in Havana Harbor in Cuba and exploded. There were over 240 people killed, sailors killed, because of that. To this day, we really don't know exactly who did it, which I've always found a little interesting. But what he did was that he, like all of the press and like most of the people, assumed that Spain had, was somehow responsible. OK, and were they probably, can we prove that? That's a stretch. But the ship blew up. And so he decided there's going to be a war. He resigned his position in the government as the Assistant Secretary of the Navy and put an ad in the newspaper all over America saying, there's going to be a war. You want to come fight in the war? Come join me. Bring your horse, bring your gun, come to New Orleans. Young men came from everywhere. They were scared to death. They were going to miss the war of their generation. And so they came. Have you ever been to Prescott, Arizona? There in Prescott, in that beautiful old courthouse, there's a statue way out front of a man by the name of Bucky O'Neill. And if you know anything about Arizona history, that guy's kind of a big deal. He really is. He was the sheriff there then, he went to New Orleans. He and that whole generation of young men went to New Orleans because they were going to go and fight with Theodore Roosevelt. They thought that was cool. 
and everybody got to New Orleans, and Theodore Roosevelt had chartered a large ship to transport everybody down to Cuba for the war. The captain said, wait a minute. Nobody told me about horses. And horses leave calling cards, OK, to put it kindly. And the captain wasn't about to put up with that nonsense, because nobody was volunteering to clean up calling cards of horses. And so what we get is a very interesting series of pictures. And I'm just going to use this one as an example. This is Frederick Remington's picture. It shows Roosevelt on his horse. Nobody else has horses because Roosevelt paid an unbelievable amount of money to the captain so that he could take his horse. Everybody else had to leave their horse in New Orleans. For a cowboy, you might as well have cut off your right arm. You know, that, that, that just doesn't go well at, at all. But they all left their horses, and they sailed to Cuba. And the charge up San Juan Hill is one of the all-time greats of the Roosevelt mythology. And Frederick Remington, that great Western painter, painter sculptor, was there. And he painted this because he saw it. Roosevelt is right out front. And he's riding his horse. And he's leaning and turning around and saying, come on, let's go, let's go. Bringing everybody up. And they ended up rolling right over the top of that hill. The, the Spanish-American War was the ideal media war. There was a seemingly a reason for it. There was a six-week war. We went in, fought. It was done. And six weeks later, everybody went home. What more can you ask for? That was just about the perfect, perfect war. And he went home a legend. He's right out front. Why in the heck he wasn't shot and killed is hard to even fathom. It really is. But he wasn't. He got home in mid-August, and 1st of September of 1898. The Republican Party came calling at his door and saying, we want you to run for governor in November. You got 48 hours to make up your mind. And so he ran for governor and got elected as governor of New York in 1898. And what a great, great thing he did. And that was going to be how he was going to serve out the next section of his life. And that was perfectly fine. And he was OK with that and loved it. Because he knew New York. And all of a sudden, the vice president, a man by the name of Garrett Woodruff, died in 1899. And so in the election of 1900, the Republican Party needs a vice presidential candidate to run with McKinley. And so let's get one of the most popular, best known, best recognized faces in America. And they come to him, and he said, he wasn't sure he wanted to be vice president of anything. But he agreed, and they ran. This is, a, <laughs> this is actually is a campaign, series of campaign slogans in a campaign picture, poster. And it is very, very interesting. And if I took the time and explained what had gone on to create all this stuff, it would be, it'd make a lot more sense. But needless to say, do political campaigns, are they always kind toward the other side? Nah. <laughs> no, no. And this one certainly isn't. And they ended up winning. OK. And he becomes the vice president of the United States. And so they move back to Washington, DC. And, and this is going to be fine. And this is going to be fun. And they've got a young family. and. Everything is going pretty well, and the life plan is that he is going to serve under McKinley. And the life plan worked out extremely, extremely well for less than a year. Less than a year. And how sad. In September of 1901, in Buffalo, New York, the Pan American Exposition is going on. And countries from all over the world have been invited to come and see what America is doing in this brand new century. And countries do come. And it is a big deal. The President of the United States is invited. The Vice President is not, because they've got the President. And so the President is invited to speak. And he comes, and he gives a very well-known speech. And people love it. 
and then he comes down off of the podium and down into the audience and he's shaking hands and talking and all of a sudden an idiot jumps out of the audience with a gun and shoots McKinley. Now, now did you notice what term I used to identify the idiot? I just said idiot. Okay, we're going to stop right there for a second and I'm going to stand over on my soapbox and I'm going to tell you my opinion. My opinion and a dollar will get you a can of pop at the right machines. So take that for what it's worth, okay? However, my opinion is anybody that tries to change history with the force of a gun never deserves to have their name or their picture ever put out there, ever again. But our media insists on doing that, aggrandizing the individual and the event. I don't care about the individual. I don't care about what, why they did it. Tell me what was lost. What did America lose? Because I don't care about their agenda. And if, a, if the media would stop aggrandizing that, then people wouldn't do things like that because their 15 minutes of fame wouldn't be there. How sad. He was badly wounded. Okay, we better go find Roosevelt just in case McKinley dies. Where the heck is Roosevelt? He's on a walking tour of the Adirondack Mountains with his family. Okay, so they send four or five guys out hiking mountains to try and find where the Roosevelts are. About three or four days, they finally find him. They tell him what's going on. They bring him back to Buffalo. He meets with McKinley. And the doctors, is he going to be okay? Yeah, he's going to recover. Great, great. Can I leave then? Can I go back on my vacation with my family? Yeah, go ahead. No problem, no problem. He leaves. Three days later, McKinley dies of pneumonia. Where's Roosevelt? Oh, crap. Now we've got to go find him again. And they had to send people out again to try and find Roosevelt. So we technically didn't have, we had a vice president and a dead president for about three days. And they finally find Roosevelt, and they bring him back, and they swear him in. He becomes the youngest president we ever had. Now, the, uh, this is a picture of the Roosevelts in the White House. This is his first daughter, Alice, and the rest of the family. So they're technically step-siblings. Now, the, you need to know something about the kids. Their number one goal while they lived in the White House, their number one goal is that every day, their goal is to sneak out to the barn on the back side of the lot of the White House and get out their miniature Shetland pony and bring their Shetland pony in and bring it in the back door of the White House and get it inside and put it in the elevator and get it upstairs so that they can play with it in the playroom. Okay? The number one goal of the staff is to prevent that from happening. Why? Because again, horses leave calling cards, don't they? Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Very interesting, very lively, lively group. I'm sorry? Oh, often, often. They often succeeded. They often got to be able to bring in the horse. And because they got pretty darn sneaky. Do kids? Did your kids ever, were they ever sneaky? Oh, no, no. Uh -uh, they were very upfront with everything, right? Sure, sure. Okay. Interesting people. A quote from Roosevelt. Believe you can, and you're halfway there. Who is the number one biggest doubter in our life of ourselves? We are, aren't we? Aren't we? Once you convince yourself that you can do something, that's the whole battle. That's the whole battle. Oh, I can't do that, or I, I'm too short, or I'm too this, or I'm too that, or oh, I don't know how, or I could. Baloney, baloney. This is what he was saying. Believe you can. And once you believe in yourself, then you can transform your world. And it's great advice then and now. One of his good friends during the presidency years was William Howard Taft. 
Taft had been the governor in the Philippines because Taft had been sent over there after the Spanish-American War. And it turned out Taft did a great job in the Philippines. The Filipino people absolutely loved this guy. He did wonderfully well in helping them rebuild their economy. Did a great, great thing. And so after the 1904 election, when Roosevelt was elected in his own right, Roosevelt brings Taft back as the new Secretary of War. We changed the name of that after World War II to the Secretary of Defense. Defense sounds like you're trying to prevent a fight. War? That sounds like you're trying to pick a fight. And so we now call it the Secretary of Defense. But anyway, they got along very well and were good friends. And, and it, it was a good, good relationship for both until Roosevelt left the presidency. Now, this is kind of an interesting little quote about Alice. When a dignitary complained to President Roosevelt about Alice, his daughter, smoking on the top of the White House, Roosevelt said, I can be President of the United States or I can be, I can control Alice. I cannot possibly do both. I've always loved that quote. <laughs> Because I also had one daughter. <laughs> and uh, wow, she kept life interesting. I love her to pieces, and she always kept life interesting, as did his daughter for him. One of the great quotes about Alice, much later, says, if you can't say any good about anybody, you come sit right down here next to me and tell me. <laughs> OK? She was just a fascinating individual. She really, really was. OK, the Panama Canal. This is a time when America wanted to have a quicker mode of transportation from the East Continent around to the West Continent. And the French had been trying to dig that canal for a long, long time and had been failing miserably at it. And we kind of took over. Theodore Roosevelt was always a hands-on guy, although I can't fathom why you would wear an all-white suit to, <laughs> to run a giant earth mover unless you're well aware of the photography possibilities, and that's a real possibility there, <laughs> okay? <laughs> and he loved it, <laughs> going down and being involved with that. He really, really did. In 1904, the Japan and Russia had had a war over some islands just off the coast of the Sakhalin Islands, between the Sakhalin Islands and the mainland Japan. And that war had uh, gone on for quite a while. And finally, Roosevelt got on his iPhone and con contacted them both and said, sit down, shut up, we're going to solve this, and did, and mediated the, pr the peace between the two countries and was given the Nobel Peace Prize for that. First American president to ever achieve that. And that was an, a very, very impressive accomplishment. He's also strongly remembered for what became known as trust busting. And he, and see, big business always thought that they had a great friend in Theodore Roosevelt because this guy came from money, lots of money. And so they, big business always figured, well, they're going to, he'll cover anything we need. And he decided that the needs of America were more important than the needs of gigantic corporations. And if gigantic corporations literally run over America, we're not being well served. And he started taking gigantic corporations to court and breaking them up. And uh, gutsy move, but very, very interesting, interesting move, and did well. By 1900, four-fifths of the university in the industries in the United States were controlled by trusts using unfair business practices. They would drop their prices to wipe out all the competition, and they would bring up their prices again. And he tried to break them up using the Sherman Antitrust Act, but he did a very, very good job with this, and it made America stop and believe that something is worthwhile here. If, you, if this even interests you at all, if the subject area of his life, I would highly recommend the book by Upton Sinclair called The Jungle. And it is the story of the food industry in the first decade of the 1900s in Chicago. 
and the meat processing in Chicago. And boy, that will open your eyes to the importance of somebody needs to be in charge of groceries and making sure that we as the American public are consuming good food. It's an interesting, interesting book. Okay. I've always loved this quote, too, especially when it was superimposed over his family. This country will not be a good place for any of us to live unless we make it a good place for all of us to live in. How true. How true. And how important that we remember that America is a wonderful place to be. You happen to recognize this guy? That is Harry Houdini. Yeah, that's where you went, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Harry Houdini. And that picture tells me that Roosevelt's level of interest were just all over the place, all over the place. Houdini, he, Roosevelt, found fascinating. Well, Houdini was fascinating. And a, a great, great series of stories about what Houdini did. But uh, I've always thought that's kind of an interesting picture that I'd never expected to see. And he became friends and exchanged many letters with Houdini. And before I leave that thought, do you know that Roosevelt during his lifetime wrote over 20,000 letters in addition to reading a book a day? Kind of makes you wonder what we're doing with our time, doesn't it? Unreal. Absolutely unbelievable. Comparison is the thief of all joy. Really? One of the biggest problems that you and I and all of us have is that we compare ourselves with somebody else. Oh, I'm not good enough because they're better than I am in this area. Or they're taller. Or they're better looking. Or they got their kneecaps are shaped better. Or some nonsense. Okay? You have great looking kneecaps, by the way. Okay. But... but Anyway, comparison is the thief of all joy. We don't need to compare ourselves with anybody anywhere. We are what is important. And we do the best we can. And quit beating ourselves up for not doing more. Get up and do the best you can. And some days that means you got out of bed successfully. And some days that means that you're out doing something. Great! Neither is bad or wrong. Do the best you can do and quit beating yourself up unnecessarily. That's what he's talking about. Nothing worth having is ever achieved without effort. I used to tell my high school students, you know, I can't understand it, but nobody has ever put money into my checking account because I'm overwhelmingly a great guy, even though there's obvious <laughs> things to see. Instead, they've waited until I've done something. And then if I've done something of value in their world, then I can get money for it. That's the whole point here. Nothing worth having is ever achieved without effort. We have to throw ourselves into doing what needs to be done. And then good things happen in our lives. During his presidency, he was an outdoorsman. And he wanted to go out. He let it be known that he wanted to go out hunting bears one day. And so they made an arrangements to get him to Alabama, of all things. Who knew Alabama had bears? Anyway, they took him to Alabama. The only bear they could find was a little bitty sickly cub, and they brought it out and said, here, President, Mr. President, go ahead and shoot, the, shoot, the, shoot, shoot your bear. He says, I'm not going to shoot a little sickly cub. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to do that. The media went crazy over this whole scenario and created drawings. A company came along and made bears and contacted him and said, can we use your name as part of this? He said, if, if my name will help sell a toy, go get them. That's where we got teddy bears. 
because of this. <laughs> Did he ask for royalties? He should have. Yet if I, I'm sure if he had any idea what a big deal teddy bears. I mean, how many teddy bears did you buy for your kids or grandkids or any, you know? Unbelievable. That's where teddy bears come from, this little event. And as much as an, he was an outdoorsman and he loved being outdoors and he loved hunting, he was not about to shoot a little cub. That didn't make any sense to him at all, at all. After he left the presidency in 1910, he became the first president that ever, or even then ex-president, to ever get in an airplane. He actually flew in an airplane in 1910. He was so impressed with the Wright brothers' plane, he wrote him out a check for $10,000 and bought an airplane from them and said, as soon as you're done building it, take it to Washington, D.C. It's going to start the United States Air Force. He underwrote the first plane that the United States ever owned. Isn't that interesting? I've loved this picture. Just, just, this is his granddaughter. And I've just loved this picture just, just because of what it shows. Absolutely what it shows. I, I, I just love that. This is Sagamore Hill, his home, where he would go back home and just recharge the batteries. And you can still go see it. And it's it's a living museum. It really, really is. He came out west because he came up with the idea that we need national parks. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Roosevelt, for realizing how important nature really is and helping it be preserved in a way that our children and our grandchildren and beyond can also have as much joy in seeing the beauty of the Grand Canyon as you and I can do by going there even today. This is John Muir, a, uh, what's the word I want? He, he's, this is kind of an interesting, interesting, are, are we running out of time? Okay, all right, that's fine. Then. Okay, now, I've always loved this tree. This tree is called, it's in the Yosemite National Monument, National Park, and this tree is called the General Sherman Tree. That is a gnarly looking tree. <laughs> and, and I just put it in there just because I just loved the picture with everybody, and you got Roosevelt, and you got John Muir, and you got all kinds of self-important people who are convinced they're important and they need to be in the picture. I don't even know who they are, but I love the tree. I just think that is an incredibly looking tree. You may recognize what's behind him. It's the Grand Canyon. He came here in 1908 and named it a national monument because the term national park wasn't in existence yet. That comes in about seven or eight years after that. But he helped preserve the land so that we can actually see the Grand Canyon. I have loved this. If you could kick the person in the pants responsible for most of your trouble, you wouldn't sit for a month. I've always thought that was pretty clever. Pretty clever, okay? This is hard to recognize. He is in front of what became the Roosevelt Dam here in Arizona. It's, a, it's less than an hour from here, right here, and you can go straight out east on the freeway, and you can go up through a globe and then take off, and you can find the Roosevelt Dam. It's named after him. Thank you. It's named after him. He came here and he helped people recognize the importance of conservation of land and water. And that's why they named it Roosevelt Dam and Roosevelt Lake. Because he came here and he was a big part of that here in Arizona. I've always absolutely loved this quote. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how strong man stumbles or how the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly and who errs and comes short again and again, 
because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, and spends himself at a worthy cause, and who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he falls, he at least falls who are daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those told and timid souls who know neither victory or defeat. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. Even if you fail at something, it doesn't matter. You tried, and that's what matters. You don't want to be an artist? It doesn't matter that you're 150 years old right now. That doesn't matter. If you want to try and become an artist, then do what you can. And don't think you have to be Michelangelo in the first weekend. Give yourself time to learn. That's what he's saying. And that's perfectly okay. And it's great, great advice. In 1912, after he'd retired from the presidency in 1908 and went on a world tour and did all kinds of interesting things, he comes back and he said his friend, President Taft, hadn't done a good enough job in running the country. And so he declared himself a candidate to become the president again in 1912. Now, the Republican Party has to support Taft because he's the sitting president. And so he creates a third party and runs as a third party candidate. And the Democrats pick up the governor of New Jersey, a man by the name of Woodrow Wilson. He called it the Bull Moose Party. Guess why? How many people do you know would hop on the back of a bull moose riding down a river? Probably something you got planned this next weekend, right? <laughs> Unbelievable. In October of 1912, he's in Milwaukee, and he is giving a speech. And all of a sudden, he stops in the speech, and he's talking, and he says, I don't know if you know what just happened, but I've just been shot. And everybody went, whoa. And he reaches in, pulls out his coat, takes his hand, puts in, pats around, all around over in his chest, ah, no blood, and goes right on speaking. And talked for almost another hour. And at the end of that time, they get him off stage, and they take him to the hospital. He had been shot. The bullet had hit right about in his heart area, because, but we also have a pocket right there. He had his glasses case. This is back when glasses cases were made out of steel. The bullet hit the glasses case. He also had 50 pages of handwritten notes he was using in the speech. He had taken it and folded it up and stuck it in there, and he was also wearing a coat. And the bullet actually hit and bruised his chest, but it didn't penetrate. What is interesting, and he was in the, in the hospital for over 10 days. What's really interesting about that, the other two candidates stopped campaigning because they didn't want to possibly gain an unfair advantage. Would that have happened during the presidential campaigns that we have been witnessing, we have witnessing the last many years? <laughs> Don't think so. Don't think so. Now, he lost the, the he lost the pres he lost that election. Taft lost the election, and Taft's opinion of that that's the greatest thing that could have ever happened. And nine years later, Taft gets nominated to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court in 1921. Thought that was the ideal job. Taft remains a Jeopardy question answer because Taft is the only person who has ever served in as the president and a member of the Supreme Court. Nobody's ever done that except Taft. Okay, and then World War I came along under Wilson. Roosevelt volunteered for service in World War I, 10 years after having served as a president. He contacted the White House, demanded and got a meeting with Wilson, went to the White House, said, give me a chance to lead troops in battle. This guy is almost, is over 50 years old. Wilson said no. 
and it was one of the heartbreaking events of Roosevelt's life. All four of Roosevelt's sons served in the military in World War I. This is Teddy Roosevelt, Jr. This is Quentin Roosevelt. Quentin Roosevelt was shot and killed in France in, in the spring of 1918. President Wilson did have the class to write the Roosevelt's a personal letter honoring Quentin Roosevelt and acknowledging the loss of their son. And then in January of 1919, one day, the nation woke up and realized Theodore Roosevelt had died today. He was 59. Now, he had heart problems. He had never completely recovered from the trip that he had made down the River of Doubt when he went down through South and through Brazil and down through the Amazon River. And he had gotten violently sick and almost died there. And in coming home, he struggled with health issues much of the rest of his life. And he died of heart complications here. This is the, on the family estate. This is the, this is the gravestone, 1858 to 1918, 1919. Edith Kermit, she was born in 1861, and she didn't die until 1948. So she lived another 29 years beyond him. I've always loved this quote. When former President Roosevelt died in his sleep in 1919, Thomas Marshall, the sitting vice president, said, death had to take Roosevelt sleeping. If it had been awake, there would have been a fight. How true. How really, really true. This is the couple. And they were just decent, good people. They really were. They went out of their way to try and make the world a better place to be. The joy of living is his who has the heart to demand it. Life is a great adventure, and I want to say to you, accept it in such a spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, if you learn nothing else about Theodore Roosevelt, I want you to remember, this man absolutely loved living. He did. He just simply loved it. He was happy to be alive. And it didn't matter what was going on. He would just loved life and loved living. And that is a great way to participate in our life and in our world. And with that, thank you for being here and hearing about Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs>